this monkey had come in, beelined her, grabbed her ice cream. Any normal child would give up an ice cream. She punched it in the face. <laughs> Jumping. She's she amazing how many children can't jump. It's like, it's really difficult. They skip. If you actually watch, and, like, and they jump, and actually their feet as well. Like sometimes you see a lot of children with feet goes out, which is the biggest thing about, as you think you find, is children at the moment, is a lot of them are fixated on um, technology. They're fixated on, they don't do very much, they don't do this. And that, they just see the top of their head. So it's getting them to understand that it's not going through, that they don't have to be a TikTok video. They can actually have fun. I mean, bearing in mind, I've been through God knows how many recessions with the business. I've gone through a pandemic. Would, if I hadn't done through that, could I have survived? And I truly don't believe we could have. Because we were in Turkey and I was at a phone party. So she's basically at a phone party at six months old, doing it on, stood on my hand and just doing a hand balance. I thought I should do that photo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Wayne Child, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. You're welcome. Yeah. How are you doing? Are you right? Yeah, it's new, just great. It's just all uh, a new experience to go and try and do. Yeah, good. Well, just uh, relax, mate, and just uh, be yourself because uh, I think uh, we'll have a bit of fun if you do that. Yeah, so, no, definitely. Happy definitely. days. Um, so, just, just for the audience, so you're the co founder and owner of Jim Bubbers. Yes, so I will own Jim Bubbers, and there's a uh, part of a founder of another company called Ball Bubbers. Okay. Jim Bubbers is my prime sort of thing that I've done for a number of years. Ball Bubbers is a new thing we're starting. Um, and we, well, I teach gymnastics to children from four months going up to 12 years. Um, and Ball Bubbers part of it is a, a joint venture with a national basketball team um, who we just teach similar type fundamental movements, but instead of being gymnastics, it's just ball sports. And that's obviously very much new. Ball Bubbers has been, uh, Jim Bubbers has been around a lot more and we're just sort of building that type of thing. But yeah, so that's where I, my base is anyway. Yeah, just okay. Going through. When did you, when was it you opened uh, Jim Bubbers again? So Jim Bubbers started trading 2011. Um, so it was, but we were building up beforehand. So we, it was started off obviously as a lifestyle business. So it was something that, Myself, my wife, Kate, who worked for a long time, so she, she sort of wanted to do this lifestyle business and I was doing my job. I was dealing with the day-to-day -day running because she didn't really know how to do websites and set everything up for it. So she was going off and I was sort of basically being breadwinner and keeping everything going for our family. And then I sort of, what I was doing was coming to an end. So she said, well, I need someone. Uh, can you come with me? Because she'd been open for a few months, and then that was it. That was what did you, what did you transition from? So I've come from lots of things, but I was an <laughs> estate agent for well, I was a water sports instructor when I was really young and doing loads from there. Then I was a estate agent from, ooh, it's got to be early two thousands into sort of two thousand and eleven, uh, two thousand and ten eleven, and then I went into working for DHL and become like a drive, van driver effectively because I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to do the six day weeks, which is ironically now because I do six day weeks again. Um, <laughs> but um, I just, I just was really good at delivering parcels at that point. I just wanted the rest for me. I didn't. I was good at the state agency, but I just. I just had enough of the targets. I was commission only, and when I was in London, it was great. When I came down here, it was just I didn't feel it as much, and I just wanted to do it. But where I was working, they were brought out by another company. They relocated it. I didn't want to relocate it at the time, and I was just like, I had enough to sort of keep everything going and just help Kate out do it. But then when I got there, I was like, actually, I can try and make this work for me. So we both got a job, so and do it from there. So it was a little bit. We did it mobile, so we used to do um, higher venues, um, basically take all of our gymnastic equipment you see so everything was made just miniaturized for the kids um into sort of two transit vans and then lug them around and then we just sort of moved from site to site and then we found a place up at christian mill at a gym um and we just were there for a couple of years to build our client base but we had to still move it back and forth uh, and just get our own because it was sort of i'd run sites I'd run, had like sort of help run state agency so I had that background I got a lot of good teachers when I was younger but it was trying to get that base of this was all a new venture for both of us we had a very very small budget like pretty much nothing to start with and then we had to slowly build uh, and to get a unit and then we just built to where we are now so we've got um we've moved from being mobile now to a site uh we've got um 
two gyms in Plymouth, which is one based at Estover, which is purpose built, and another one over at Plimpton. Um, around about sort of two and a half, three thousand square foot. But a lot of the stuff is effectively you see in a big gym, just miniaturised for the kids to use. Mm. <laughs> Classic. So fun. Yeah, cool. And what was Kate's background? So Kate's background is diving. So she was quite a high level diet platform diver. Um, I believe she was like British champion and she was she went to European things like that. So she's quite high level. Um and then she but she's gymnastics, she used to do it at the because obviously they're all related. And she her she built that over time. So she's she's gonna hate me saying this, but she's been doing it for over twenty years, like even longer. So she's got quite a lot of knowledge from it. She studied at uni and she's just built it out from there. Um and then she went off to she just didn't want to do the elite stuff anymore because she was teaching to a high level and um, which she wanted to do the recreation because that's what we do and um she, she went off to london honed her skill at a company in london and then unfortunately her, her dad got ill and passed away so she came down here to be with her mum and then that's how she was like right i want to do what i was doing there the company she was working for it wasn't quite the sort of remit they didn't think it was a remit down here for it they wouldn't sell a franchise down here because she was going to do it um so she thought well she actually said to him you either do it with me or i'm doing it on my own so that's when we just sort of decided to right we're going to set this up um and she was in the same mindset it was just going to be a couple of days a week to take her over and she was going to move get a little van move it all around and do it on her own and even she was like i don't think we're ever going to get big but because of the way we work she is very much on the gymnastics sides and she does all the plans my view was i'm coming and going I'm going to take over the world with this and just do it. So I'm like pushing her, like literally sort of with a foot firmly up her ass going, right, we're doing this and, <laughs> and just, we're going to go for it. And when we moved to, so when we, we were, we were at the Devonshire funnily enough to start with on court eight and we had to go around there when we finished there because we were at a time where it was all having different companies take over it. We heard on the great fund that they were getting kicked out all of outside um people so we moved to and the other center and when we got there we just grew to the point where there was only so many hours we only had four hours a day and we we're like we need more and we've got kids growing older and that's when we took on our first unit estover um had 10 weeks to turn it around to get basically turn it from an empty shell into a gym and make it look re reasonably respectable and then move them in and we've been there now i think we're coming on to our 11th year at estover so yeah, we've been going for a while so i think in total um no, no, sorry, 10 years this year. So we've, we've been really building and building. Um, and as we, we just outgressed over, and that's when Plimpton came through. So we've just, we are at a point, we teach, on average, it's about 1,000 to 1,100 kids a week. So it's a... It's a 1,100 kids a week? Yeah, individual kids. Some siblings, some's not. I mean, we're busy. That's I mean, crazy. even now, we've got, it goes up and down. I was so. wondering then when you were talking, I was thinking, what numbers do you, what sort of numbers do you have? And yeah. That, that is, of, that's a lot, a lot. Yeah, I mean, we're still growing. I mean, we've that's got... Good. Last term, we, last term, our biggest one, we just we managed to sort of just pass the 1100 mark. This term, we're just sort of hovering around a thousand. So that's where it's going through. And when we, because it sort of goes up and down in enrollment. So, because we only teach during term time. So it works, it works, it works well. But there's just a lot of keeping it going and keeping it uh, just building and building and building. Mm. So, yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's one of those things where you, you've got to think months ahead. You've got to keep an eye on children's ages, their ability, who's doing well, who's not, who's trying to, who's having a little bit of a wobble. So it's, it's a lot of management to do from there. And as it's gotten to that stage now, me and Kate aren't as involved in teaching, but we are still heavily there because we've just taken it, taking them to keep everything going and keep yeah. the walls turning. Yeah, how many staff do you have? Currently, mm. uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hang on, I've got. I love it. He's, I'm, I'm the business guy. Takes case of talent. Don't know how many staff I've got. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I do actually. That's a lie. I think I've got about eleven at the moment. Yeah, okay. So I've got um, nine full timers, and the rest are part time. And the two of one of them is my son. So he just works Saturday. He's just managed to get his uh, little work permit to work. So yeah. So he's he's now starting to earn, and which is good. Um, but yeah, and we're looking to build on that we were we've reduced a lot and that's partly because of covid and partly because we rebranded a little bit um but it will pick up again we're slowly i feel i'm getting the confidence to say right i can bring someone else in now to do it i'm quite in, enjoying not to have that many staff sometimes because it is nice because you are a local apprentice but you just have to build in it. So we're gonna, we'll probably get back to the numbers we used to have, but it would just take a couple of years, I reckon. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, the, the most, I think it was a couple of years ago I had 18, I think of us. So 
that was hard because eight, 18 pretty much full timers was mm -hmm. a lot of characters to keep going a lot of different people so yeah i it, that would take a while to get back to it again but i'm happy where we are we actually we're doing better if we're having less people and which is a shame really because i like employing people i liked it's not about have it well you know for me i always like proud of i've got these amount of people working for me because i think it's just i'm a working lad i've always been and i just think people should be working as much as they can so yeah, happy days we'll get into some of the um finer details of the ups and downs of the business because i know obviously during the pandemic it was a bit of a, a challenge for you uh, before we do that i wanted to go back a little bit though and it's i know obviously you met kate and that was kind of the driving force into it a little bit but it's slightly unusual business for people to get into so growing up did you ever did you ever expect to be doing this type of job? Yes, and actually, that's a lie. Yeah, no, no, not for what I do now. Yeah. But yes, in leisure. So, I'm I'm a London boy. I was born born and bred in East London. Um, I had a bit of a funny upbringing, and there's several times there. But my my goal is I wanted to be a sailing instructor, and that's what I wanted to do. I was really good at it, but obviously, a few things happened that stopped me from doing it, and I just had to. I just had to make money and go from there because I had no, I had nowhere to go and no, no sort of income and no family. So I just was like, right, I need to get a job. I need to get paid the rent. I need to pay the bills, and that's why I jumped into a state agency because it was, uh, it was an ex girlfriend that actually helped me get into it, mm -hmm. and because uh, her mum used to do it, and she was like, you'd be quite good at that. Give it a go, and I, and I was, um, but no, I wanted to be, and I actually did quite a lot of courses because it's always a running joke that I'm, I'm scared of heights, but I'm a qualified mm -hmm. air cabin crew. And because I did it, it was, <laughs> yeah, I could, this is what I said. I'm like, I, I told you I get in situations. So I was at college and I just, if there's anything for free, cause I was working full time and going to college cause I didn't have anyone there. Yeah. And, um, I got on a course and I was like, right, any course is going. So you just on everything. So it'd be like customer service course from there cause they were free. And I was like, right, okay. Oh, there's an air cabin crew thing. I'll do that. And I had to go Heathrow and go from there. Never used it. But I did the whole thing and did really well. And but I was like, I'm petrified heights. So I'm not going to use it. So, so you're, legit, but, you're a qualified trolley dolly. Yeah. Wow. Basically, I did. I go from there, and I did. I actually was quite good at going in and doing all the signs and like going learning how to do it all. And uh, it is a running joke because I still have my little qualification. So I remember the you, you knew that you were never going to even bother doing it, but you still went and done it. Do you know what? I was more of the fact that I just knew that I was. I'm. Um, severely dyslexic I'm really good at practical things and I knew that I ain't didn't have my GCCs I only got a couple of GCCs and I thought I've got to get everything going I didn't want to be a builder and as much as a lot of my friends were doing it I didn't want to go into that route so I was like right I want to do leisure custom service was something I'm quite good at I'll just go and do it to see what it can go through. And there is certain things that you can pick from that and how you talk to people and how you deal with people in a heated situation because there was quite a lot of training for that. But no, it was a case of it was a day that I didn't have to go and do work. And I was like, okay, I'll go and do that down at Heathrow. And uh, we did that. Custom. There, was a, there, was, there was two options. There was the air cabin crew and there was the customer service. And I thought, I'll do the air cabin crew. Just, I thought, why not? Let's give it a go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. I, t I literally, I've got some qualifications that I think I don't know if I'm actually relevant for anything yeah. but. <laughs> so do you say you were you wanted to be a sailing instructor did I hear that right yeah so, so I, how did you get into sailing as a kid so I was a tear away okay I was a little bit tear away. so when I so you I, stole a sailing boat is that what you're going to tell us no <laughs> I have done um, I have done um, no basically I went I was I was brought up in Hackney we were brought up in a really low deprived area and the school I went there was me and two other kids that were just a little bit of trouble and our teacher at the time in our school, Mr. Crockett, and he's passed away now, he's like long gone. But he he just was like, he'd only ever taught you by your last name. And he just basically one day, as a punishment, dragged me along to sailing. I must have been about six or seven. And it was like middle of October, it was Baltic. And we got taken to Bambi Reservoir up in North London. And it was like, the first thing we've got to do is right, you've got to see if you can swim. So they didn't, they didn't like give it, they literally give you a wetsuit, point aid, and this was obviously back in the 80s so it'd be like there wasn't the safe thing are you sure you want to do this now do you want to go it was pick you up throw you in and off you go and you swum and you got to the other side and got out and that's how it started and then they stuck me in a boat and they were called oppies which were effectively bath tubs with a sail but i quickly turned out that they are like bumper cars so i quite liked it and i was actually quite good at steering around and bumping into people and then as the sort of years progressed i sort of really started to enjoy it and i was getting to the point where the club that i was at said oh 
why don't you try and enter some little regattas and like your competitions? I was like, okay. I did quite well on those, went up to into the next level, which was toppers, and then started getting introduced into faster boats, which is what the lasers and things. So they, I just really enjoyed it. So I just was like, okay, I can, I can do this. And that's what I wanted to do. But I had a lot of bad things, because obviously I lost my old man when I was 10. My mum was not very nice, quite horrible to me, and like sort of in our hospital and uh, basically just not very helpful to keep it going. So I was trying to do as much as I can as well as do it. So I, I just sort of jumped in and out of it. And when I got old enough, I managed to get myself on a course that um, with Le Burnham Boat Club um, in London. And they did it things for basically people that were going nowhere in life, which is where I was going. They said, right, we can get you courses. We can put you on your level, like your level one, your level two courses and get you qualified. So I just like, yeah, okay. So I jumped on it. I was, and it got you your narrowboat skippers, your sailing instructors, your canoeing instructors, your powerboat and water ski instructor and everything. So I went through all of them. But at the time, it was a very seasonal thing because obviously not many people in London in the 80s really wanted to do sailing. It wasn't a massive thing. It is a boring sport. It, it, like, as much as I love it and I can talk to it all the time, but from a spectator perspective, it's not a sport that you sit and go, and go oh, look at that person. He's, he's, like, he's tacked around there wrong. Like, sort yeah. of thing. So you, you just, it wasn't that type of thing that, like it is now. And I, I then basically, if I'm brutally honest, found boots of women and just thought, I'm going to do that instead because I was getting older and getting to be 16, 17. And that's what I, I was like trying to come away from it. And I just wasn't earning the money. And I was on my own. I, had, I just literally was living on my own and I had to pay me rent. I had to pay me everything else. So I just was like, right, I'm not going to make any money from it. The guy I was working for was like, please give me a full-time job. And he said, I can't. I, I just can't. He said, like, we work basically on volunteers and part-timers. We can't just afford you. And I was having to travel around and I just fell out of it. So, and it got to the point where my hobby was my job and I just didn't quite enjoy it that much. Mm. Now I probably would, being older and wiser, I think, because you think you could go from there. But I think that's my background for it. So I used to teach sailing. Um, there is a, I have got a cameo in the Bond film in a do, a London Docklands, it's basically a sailing centre. If you sit at the back, I can't remember if it's the world is not enough when in the speedboat, there's the dragon boats. I'm actually on one of those dragon boats because they basically pulled us out. And if you can see carefully, there's probably a load of kids doing moons because that's what I've got them doing. So just like putting moons, like to go for it. Because they were annoying me because they were in our way. We didn't know they were there. And we were like, oh, they're just using our dock. But they were creating waves. And I had like a school group that day. And I was just a bit like, oh, come on. Just fuck off, go away. Like, don't from there. And I just got the kids like, just moon them. They'll go away. <laughs> and I, th I don't know because I can never pause it in time. But I think it might be on the film. But <laughs> they just was like, go for it. And I, I did get in trouble for that. But... I was just, I was just like, just go away. Just like, it was in my way. So yeah, so it was, uh, I, I enjoyed it, but I still go, I still do it. I still to this day do it. I mean, it's only literally um, a couple of weeks back I was out sailing. So it's not like I've given up on it and forever. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of big boat stuff. And when I, I left the dinghies because I knew I, I was too fat and too slow to get to go too fast, but I was big enough to hold my own and not lose my uh, way on the bigger boats. So I just jumped onto mm. that. And did you find that that kept you out of trouble then when you were younger? Or do you still get in trouble alongside that? No, I still got in trouble. So what sort of stuff were you getting up to when you were a kid? I, uh, yeah, a lot. I mean, I, I was brought up, I mean, I, I lived in, I was brought up and around North Florida State and in London, which at the time was quite a rough estate. So I, at the time, I was very good at nicking metros and doing things like that. So I was like, that was my forte. I could get into one out of them. You could just do it with a flathead screwdriver because they were really good. Like, a bit of shoplifting and things like that. So I, I've done things that nowadays I'm not proud of. I'm not proud of at all and I don't condone them. But there was, I didn't really have the parental guidance that I probably should have. Um, I was let, like my, my old man got cancer when I was really young. So he spent a lot of his time. He died when I was 10. So he didn't really do anything. My mum pretty much blamed me for it, for it. So she didn't really want me, but it was sort of, that type of thing so I had no guidance so it was only a couple of people's parents who were like just sort your life out and there was a few things that I did that I'm not proud of and I'll like to this day I'm like you shouldn't have done that but I I, f I met the wrong end of the law a few times and what sort of changed my moment was the fella that was doing it I can't remember his name but he was just like you're smart because I was I was a follower until I realised that actually I don't need to be a follower. I can do this without acting, be be involved. I be from there, and 
there was a, a, a fella that used to take me, and I'm going to be honest, I used to take me beer running. So do you remember in the 80s? Well, they did it on Top Gear. Remember that on Top Gear, they did that episode where Jeremy Clarkson went to the a beer thing and he used to go over that van, he could load it up with beer and then bring it back. It, was, it, was, it used to be you can go back and forth from the ferry and you could do it at a time. My dad, I mean, bearing in mind my dad was a bank robber. So <laughs> you say like that, but that, that's quite a statement to say, just bear no, in mind. My dad was a so you need to tell us more about that. a good bank robber because we lived in Leeds Hackney. But okay. He was a bank robber. He got put away for it. He did it, like, obviously. Uh, so he, he was, he did, it was before my time. So he was so casually then, yeah, yeah, well, he, my dad yeah. was a bank robber. <laughs> uh, but he was. And it was, it was just that type of thing. So he, it, it was, those walks of life don't go away. They're still around and go from there. So I was like, not that I wanted to be him because I didn't, but I, because of where we were, he was quite known and he just used to do things. And I used to hang around and I did fall into the wrong crowd because I just didn't have that guidance. Did they associate you obviously as your father's son and, and therefore? They did where, they did from the older perspective. You've got to remember my dad was 59 when he died. So he was a lot older. Um, so, and I was, it was pub culture. So it was Hackney pub culture. We didn't, I mean, we did sort of have a Game Boys, but there was no social media. There wasn't like what we have now. So it was a very different thing. We we used to go out and socialise and something there. So he used to do a lot of stuff. I mean, there is, like I say, like there is a story. I think I told you about this. Did I tell you about the chocolate lorry? So my, my dad was involved in something that basically, because he used to drive articulated lorries and he nicked this articulated lorry full of chocolate and brought it to our estate and it was part up and I remember being a little kid sat in the middle of this as we were going along thinking it's a lovely day out thinking from there but it really wasn't because he was just like stealing it and then just giving his chocolate away and I was like and I wondered why it was there and there was loads of people come in and disappearing and then all of a sudden they um, well he was just selling it off the back of the lorry sort yeah, of thing yeah selling off the back of the lorry this was probably this was from my earliest memory actually so it was like I was really young I must have been about four or five so like it was really yeah. really young and I just remember sitting in that centre bit lorry, like just going through, jumping on the back, and hence obviously why I probably got obese as I did, because you just <laughs> stick like that, that's all we had. And um, and I just remember that happening, thinking, okay, oh, this is really cool. But, like we're sending this on through, like from that type of thing. But obviously looking back on it now, thinking that really wasn't cool. That was really bad. Like I wouldn't, would I even dream of doing it with my two kids? No, no, <laughs> no not a chance. No. But it was something that is sort of make me who I am and uh, and I just remember one day sort of going to bed Laurie was there waking up the lorry had gone and I don't, it was never spoken about again but that's the type of so the people he knew were still around and so when he passed away they sort of had that thing that used to be around in that sort of pub bloke type thing we'll take you on over and we'll look after you however they didn't necessarily teach me sometimes the right things and go from there so that was where it went through so I I sort of understood because ultimately I still had like my cousins and stuff. They were making sure that don't do it, don't do it. Cause they were like trying to keep me out of trouble and help me out. And um, yeah, so I, I know from that side of things. So yeah, from, from him, his perspective, he, he was not a very nice, he wasn't the greatest of people in the world. I wouldn't say he's like, he, he's respected in society as he is now. But as I um, got older and started to get into the sort of stuff that he used to do. This fella, and I'm not going to say his name because I don't know if he's still around or if he still does that type of thing, but he used to take me out for a day trip to look after me. It goes through because my mum and dad, my mum went around and and uh, it was basically beer running. So we used to go over, we'd get, get up at four o'clock in the morning, get in the van, there'd be loads of people, drive over, get the stuff, drive back, swap vans, go over again. So we'd do this three or four times a day. And this one time, I must have been about, I'm going to say 15 and 15, 16. And he taught me how to drive the van. And he said, we got to do is just drive it through. And I was like, I don't want to do that. And he said, no, just do it, just drive it through. But at the time I was a bit scared of him. I was like, okay, do it. So I just did it, went across, but got caught. And the guy who caught me was the guy who basically said, I've got you. I know who you are. I know like you've been, we've caught you so many times on different things. You're a smart lad. You've got to do it. He said, cause the next time I catch you, I'm going to throw the book at you for everything. And that scared me because I thought, I don't like, I don't like prison food. And I don't, I don't think I'll be very good at picking soap off off the floor. So I just was like, right, I'm going to, I need to change my life. And at that point, I genuinely got scared of it. But I didn't, obviously I made friends as much as my friends, that some of them were drug dealers, some of them were doing things that are not going through. I mean, a lot of, I've got friends that have been that are going around that doing stuff like stabbing people that are thinking, they're not here, no longer here, but 
they were someone that I grew up with, I went to school with. So it's like, you, even though I knew it was wrong, I didn't really have anyone to fall on. I've, it was two people that I did, and but they sometimes didn't know anything about this sort of stuff because I didn't really want people to know because I was just trying to keep my head down and trying to just get through life because as far as I was concerned, my mum was horrible. She was never around. I believe she was dead for a number of years until I found that's enough again. You know about that one, didn't you? Was it? You, yeah, you're gonna have to explain that. Yeah, come on. Does she, she, might, she might know nothing because. Um, well, I want to know. Yeah, Danny what doesn't, and the audience don't. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's a different concept. But I. Are I you, <laughs> what you <mean>? right? <laughs> what you can't tell it. Fin, you don't fin, want fin, okay. Finish your story. Finish, we'll circle so back. I, I'm <laughs> basically. I was trying to keep a lot of people out of it. I should keep out of that so, same circle of friends, but not let people know, and try and keep it as keep myself out of trouble as much as possible yeah. and that's when I was like right I've got to just sit my head down and get a job and go through and after that day to be honest with you I just stopped I was just like I just was so scared because I even to, to get caught and to get anything else and don't get me wrong there are a couple of things that happened in my life that I probably think mm, I shouldn't have done that but and it, it was one of those things that it sort of never on the original. same extreme never never on the same extreme and I just was like I just ne- realised that I've had a really close call I've got it was the it was the pinpoint in my life where it's right. I can carry on going like this, and I'm going to be in and out of prison, and I'm going to be. I'm probably, to be brutally honest with you, even my wife says I probably wouldn't be here, um, and a lot of my friends say it as well. Um, or just use what on my knowledge and use the fact that I was quite ingenuitive. I was quite a way of getting myself out of situations, and I had a bit of a gift of the gab to do it and just go out and make some decent money and just go from there. So I just sort of was like right, I just stuck my head down. I didn't get in trouble, I've become a bit soft and just sort of walked away from it. And I don't miss it at all because I just sort of think, one, I wouldn't have what I've got now. Um, and two, I realised as, as sort of, and very fairly quickly that it was a lot nicer to have, like to try and build a bit of a life. And it was only, it wasn't too long ago, actually, a friend of mine's mum died and I went back and I was at this funeral and I've gone there, bearing in mind I was at the gym. I went there and I thought, right, I don't really want to, show that I'm doing massively well but I don't want to look like I'm piss poor so I went in there just well dressed to go through and there was all these people going what do you do and things like that and I was like okay yeah I'll do this oh can you give us a job and bear in mind while I was doing this one of my friend was had a crack pipe hanging out of his pocket another guy was just sort of going well I've just nicked this thing and I'm like I'm so glad that I don't yeah you're fucking out I'm yeah. out of that because mm. I came back and I think I saw you about it a couple of days later and I just said, I'm so, I came back to you and I was like, I'm so glad I'm not involved in that anymore because one, like they were, they were the same age as me but looked a lot older. Two, they were just all like living off the dole. They were like, just going, they were begging me for handouts and I'm thinking, that's where I could have been and that's what I could have done. And But don't get me wrong, there's a few of my friends that we all decided in life that we were going to do this and some, I've got some really close friends that just decided to, go and do be normal people but there was that little circle that a lot of people I tried to keep out of out of my normal life I say because I did want to have a normal life I didn't want to strive to be like my old man and do from there going on to the so my mum I believe passed away at what age oh, what wage were you I mean I've got to say I can't remember, it's between, between 15 and, between 15 and 17, roughly, I can't remember because it's so, going through. So, you so basically, no, my mum, my mum had a heart attack. Mm-hmm. I, she used to scare the living daylights. Like she was very old to me. So she was, she used to whack me a lot. She was really abusive. She kicked me out quite a lot, go for it. I wasn't the easiest child, as you can understand, like a child to live with, but she wasn't the most thing for me. When my old man died, she had a heart attack the same day. So it was like, there was a constant health issues going through. And then she just, me being who I am, obviously, I was trying to deal with losing my old man, the fact I was illiterate, and I was trying to just get through life. And um, she just, I was, she just scared me, when I die, you'll be put in a foster home, things like that. So bearing in mind, I knew I probably wouldn't be, but that's my mindset, I was scared. She had a heart attack, she was flatlining, that's all I remember seeing her, and just going, right, they're gonna, like, we're gonna just ring social, sort of thing out, because I was, I just, I just ran. I was just like, I'm not doing this, I don't wanna get involved. So I just ran, and, Left it, as far as I'm concerned, she's dead. Because I didn't, to be honest with you, I didn't really care. She, I didn't, I didn't like my mum and she was just not a very nice person. Um, and I just assumed for many years that she'd been dead. And it must have been just soon after we opened the gym, I'd gone home after a day doing the classes and there was this woman sat 
in a very nice car in a suit and a suitcase got out and so are you Wayne child yeah and she was like okay I'm such and such from air hunters I was like excuse me so I'm here about your mum are you fucking joking <laughs> and I said I'm here about your mum and I'm like no she's dead what are you about and go free and I was like just go away like I don't know who you are just go free nothing more shut the door She's not on the door and she's no, this is real. Here's the solicitor's letter. Here is what we've got. Your, your mum died. I said, yeah, she died years ago, like 15 odd years ago. No, no, she died a few years ago. I was like, what do you mean she died a few years ago? She basically survived, not got in contact with me, but died of Alzheimer's a number of years later and I had no clue. <laughs> so so when she had that initial heart, or that heart attack when you seen her in hospital, flatline, she never thought thought of contacting you no. so what, what did you do then at like 14 just, 15 what you just lived back at home and just just went off i was a bit i, I was i probably said i was a bit older just went off i was working and you just, just doing from there just doing what i want just working i just just thought, and she just, just never made up. contact no. say no. 40 yeah, years 40 years but then she had dementia at the end so she wouldn't have a clue who she was but i it was one of those things where i was a little bit denial about it didn't want it and my wife sat me down and was going look I just, and I, she was like, I was like, look, I don't care. She could be a millionaire. I don't want it. I said, it's blood money. I don't, do not want it. It's not about the money to go through. I do not anything from that woman. She, and then she just sat down and just said, look, why don't we do this? If you don't want it, that's fine. But why don't we use it for work? You never touch it. So I said, I don't want to, I don't want to have a, I don't want to buy anything from it. I don't want to achieve anything for it from there. So we took the money and we built the first gym. And that was it. So I just, and I was like, because it was one of those things I thought, no, I don't want to pay. So every penny went everything. I just didn't have it. I didn't, there was nothing left. And I was like, no, I don't want anything. Because I knew that's what she, she would have hated it because it's something that she would have never believed in. Mm -hmm. So I literally threw every penny into this gym. And um, I wouldn't take anything. I didn't even take a wage because I refused to. Because I thought, no, that, that woman's paid for this. And it was only the fact that, um, a member of staff I had at the time knew all what was going on. And he just said, you've been stupid. You, you, you need to start taking this. Like you've, you've done something she probably wouldn't like anyway. So that's when I started to take things back again. But yeah, that's, that's, that. it that's was, a yeah. fucking, that's a crazy story, isn't it? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Fucking yeah. hell. Yeah, that's it. The air hunter coming in, it took a while because I was like, you can't, you, you couldn't write it, so I've, I've got a really good friend. I felt I gestured when you said that because we had uh, Trevor Worth uh, from Port Collis, and we talked about it, how yeah. air hunters. So I didn't yeah. even know it was a thing until no. then. I never, I never heard of it. Yeah. I I used to watch it because it was the same company that did the program. Right, okay. <laughs> they, yeah, were you looking? Were you looking for the cameras and stuff? No, because they, <laughs> no, no, they genuinely the asked me to be on camera about it right. to talk about it because it was a massive thing. Because they didn't, they thought I was making it up, and I was like, I have no clue. Because like they say that that program they bring in co distance cousins not a direct relative and that was the bit that got them they were like how did you not know I, said, I ain't got a clue and they were like are you genuine I didn't know she was dead do you, I, do you find it mad meant, like did you grow up fairly poor yeah and then I know, do you know I weren't it's, it's like that sketch from that face I weren't piss poor but I was poor enough I mean my old man if I wanted something he'd nick it like yeah. that type of thing and he just that's the way if, I, if there was a new thing I never questioned where my stuff came from but I used to was get you it. really surprised with that she had from the point that you probably left well when you thought she was dead to then getting a knock on the door saying that she's got X amount of money I don't left. know how much it was I do not even know no I didn't want to know yeah but, I I, I, but was I you surprised that she had that I have a rough idea because I had to sign a paperwork but yeah. in the end I didn't go through so there was like they were asking me loads of questions. It was like, do you want a jewelry? Like there was a, there was a fit a package and I thought, oh God, they're going to give me the ashes. And I'm like, I don't want the ashes. So it was like, oh no, she's been buried somewhere. We can find out when you're buried. And I was, I was like adamant, no. I was like, I don't want to know. Because everyone was like, well, why do you not want to know? I said, because genuinely I'd dance in her grave. I said, because I don't mean that horribly. So I know you should love your mum and stuff like that. She was a horrible, horrible person. And she just, she mucked with me more than I actually realised until I got, until that happened. And I was a bit like... I think it's one of those things where when you have your own kids and you see how you love your own children and how you feel about your own children, you kind of realise what, at times, people's parents and other parents and whatever else, or your own parents, were treating you, you know, like. Do you, do you know, know what, what I mean? Yeah, you think, how the fuck do they do that? Or, you know, know what, what I mean? It's, it's, it's a running joke with my family because I always threaten with my kids like, I'm a very underpaid type thing. It's a joke to them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, it is, it is a running joke. Like, did he, it, I, it was on the team 
does he like me? Like that type of a joke. And then they know I do because I do loads of stuff for him. But I think it's definitely the the way I do, the way I build, do things, that is probably a mixture between sort of my old way I was brought up, but then thinking, no, I don't want that. But I mean, as much as I glamorized a lot of their stuff for my dad and think it was great, you've got to remember, he was a raging alcoholic. They were in a very abusive relationship and I had all of that. So I didn't, I didn't want that for my kids. I didn't want that. I'm quite, I'm in a quite a level relationship in the point of view that I've, me and my wife have never really been apart. Like I mean, she was like my, in my housemate in my flat share type of thing. And we ended up getting together. We've always been together. I think the only time we did was a, a month or so when I went traveling for a little bit with my, from my friend's 40th. And that, it, that's the only time we've really, really parted. Obviously, we work together as well. So it's sort of, we, we've we become that sort of, it's n normalised now, whereas I know that that was never. But then saying that, I'm at the age where my son is like, we're becoming abnormal because the parents are together. So it's like a little bit different now. So it's a bit strange. So well, it's, it's abnormal because you're both still together. Yeah. A yeah, lot of my sure. son's friends are not necessarily with how, how old's your son? 13. Yeah. So... I had to think about that because I've, yeah. I've got two, I've got one I've got a four year old as well so and she's yeah she's a nightmare but she's uh, yeah I've got a 13 and four year old but it's just trying to remember but they're it, he he obviously it's, it's really weird because obviously she's at that toddler age it's a different mindset after COVID whereas he's a little bit of the old school where safety wasn't didn't necessarily it was coming into it but it isn't as mad as it is now yeah, yeah. yeah. that's crazy <laughs> you've done all right mate you've done pretty well <laughs> do you know what I mean like yeah, yeah I that, think... that mum story mate that'll stick with me that one yeah that's, mate that's a, that's yeah. A nice one, but mate it? fair play because yeah that sort of upbringing some people do fucking continue down that wrong path and I think obviously you had a bit of a touch I guess with that with that copper as well just giving you a bit of a pass because I think when you're young that one conviction potentially could then put you into that that fucking spiral I think once you get that one conviction it's hard as well to yeah. get out of it get, yeah, hard yeah. to get a job hard yeah, to get I mean, it's, it's, still, it's still I mean don't be wrong I'm it's, it's well and truly in the past now, so I don't have to worry about it as such. But it did affect a lot of stuff I did because it used to come up. And it just, it, it's one of those things that you just, I, I'm a firm believer is that I've not, I've not murdered anyone. I've not done anything like that. So it's not like I've done anything like bad to the point of view that it's to warrant that type of thing, like to not work on what it's I do. Hurting, but yeah. I do think that I know now it's wrong. Um, it's just it's something that it is me. I'm not going to change it. Would it, would the way I look at it is, would what I have now be run the way it is the way if I didn't have what that, because ultimately, I mean, bearing in mind, I've been through God knows how many recessions with the business. I've gone through a pandemic. Would, if I hadn't done through that, could I have survived? And I truly don't believe we could have, because I think the fact that I have become, I have got this hard exterior and it's very, very rarely that I cry and things like that because of the way it's, I think it's because I'm just a case of, I can just deal with a drama, I can deal with a situation and get through it and find a solution. I'm a problem solver as such. So, and I think that's by the, by the person that I was made from being that person when I was younger. Yeah. Well, and, uh, adversity <laughs> builds resilience, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. You know I mean, I mean like, you can't, I mean, you, you can't, do a lot of stuff like I mean being a stage I saw lots of different people and lots of uh, different walks of life and I have to become very very patient with people but it is it's just something you build upon and you just it wouldn't it's definitely helped me in life yeah no I, 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 we've, we've talked a couple of times maybe not to that extent but we obviously grew up in council estates as well and I haven't always um, been an angel for sure um, and yeah I agree I think sometimes going through some of those things will definitely give you resilience to get through everyday stuff and in business. So how did you end up in Plymouth then? Well, it's the sort of thing. I lived in this sort of massive six bedroom house at the time with six blokes and we had a, we had a ball. We, we were just, it was good fun to like a lot of them. I'm still good friends with them. I mean, one of them's sort of godson to my kids. Fred, who I'll always mention is just this massive sort of, he he came over for Sierra Leone and he's got this very very posh British accent and uh, he's just trying to be like Andy Peters and I've just it's one of those type of things he's like he's sort of getting on I get him so well with him and we got through and then a girl moved in who's my wife and ruined it all and um, she we just she was like ruined the whole banter because she sort of started putting a duvet on the sofa and that's that ruined it for the household and then we we got together and it started taking off but Kate was from Plymouth and her old man was diagnosed with cancer. So we just, she was coming down quite a lot to help out. And then 
we got married in 2009 and my old man, uh, sorry, Kate's old man got basically given so many months to live. So I think we got married on July 31st and the 1st of August she moved down to Plymouth to be with her dad and that was it. She never really come back. So I was living in London and we were to and fro in while she was helping out. Then our old man passed away and then I just was like, I've got really nothing holding me here. Like I've got, I, I don't really need to be here because like my friend, who, a good friend of mine was like, just, you'll enjoy it down there, go through. And it took me a while to get used to it down here. I have to say like, the weather and I just was like everything shuts early I was used to being everything being open all the time so it took me a couple of years and then after a while I sort of softened and was like I quite like this sort of way of life but I quite like the fact that I could do what I was doing and enjoy it and, and doing well effectively um, but when I moved down it was it was not out of choice. I wouldn't have made that decision I'm going to move to Plymouth because that was never our plan to move to Plymouth um, but when we did it was we loved it and now I've got obviously family we've obviously found out when we got married we found out Kate was pregnant so it was always a, mm. a shotgun wedding type of feel and, <laughs> and then it just sort of when the business started it just never really left so and I'm, I'm quite settled in I, 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 it's sort of it's more home than London is now I, I, I sort of just have it, it, I, I, I'm, I say I'm from London but Plymouth's my home now I quite enjoy it and I wouldn't change it yeah, so yes. alright amazing so so obviously you touched on, um, I guess, the inception of Jim Bubbers and you're now in Plymouth. You told us a little bit about how you financed it. Um, you also mentioned about obviously the upbringing you had kind of give you some resilience to, to deal with some adversities in the business. So I guess moving on to some of that stuff. So tell us about some of the, the ups and downs, I guess, of, of running your own business. So I suppose not having a clue. I mean, going into this, I knew how to do day-to-day -day run tax and things like that, but it's just the everyday things of just keeping a balance sheet. The nature of what we do, it's not like you take money every day. You you have free bulk payments every year and we have to save that and spread that payment throughout the year to pay the rent. The first big one, which was like, I remember it vividly that we were sat at home. My little boy was just like, I want this for Christmas, that Christmas. And when I did all the figures, I was I, I misjudged 10 grand and we didn't have 10 grand. And we were like, Oh shit! What we're we gonna do? Like we're gonna shit. We we are seriously up the street. We we don't know what to do. Um. So we we basically knuckled down. Like, what can we save here and now? We we literally did everything. So we did all the marketing ourselves. We letter dropping. We do loads because we were putting all that out there. Mm -hmm. Marketing stopped. Um. We just couldn't. We couldn't afford to do it. So that was the biggest thing. We managed to get through. We like just. I mean, literally just. We were like, we. The way we did it, we managed to survive to get enough money to pay it, but then we got it, knocked it down to about seven grand loss. Then we were like trying to build it back up and then we managed to get ourselves back in. Um, when we first went VAT, that was hard. That was really hard because the problem you got, the nature of what we do, we charge v, VAT is inclusive. So we were used to it. So once we got the account we had, was like, if you're going to go past VAT, there's the threshold, stay below it and you'll learn this. If you're going to go past it, smash it. Don't just hang around to this bit. So like, and we were like, okay, fine. So we put our head down and do it. But then again, every time you've got this massive VAT bill going out. So we were like, we were not putting money aside. We think like we've done it. And then we got the VAT bill. So it took a lot of mindset of go, right, every quarter, I've got to make sure I've got so much to put aside. And it's it was one of those things where early days, we were only talking a few thousand pounds, but it was a few thousand pounds between being open and shut. Um, one part was getting a unit that was really hard that really took its toll because the when we it's not so hard now because they changed a lot of the rulings for it but getting planning permissions was really quite difficult we just felt that we were it, the, the council were pushing every boundary going and it was like they wanted core samples they wanted this and with that it was like it's a kid's gym like it's what do you need core samples for oh because in 1970 it was this I was like yeah, but it's 2013. It's like, it's a big difference. Like a lot's happened since then. And it got to the point where we'd get over one hurdle, they'd put something else in play. They'd get over one, put something else in play. And the, the bit that was the sort of grinding halt for me was there's not enough parking spaces. And I'm like, you're having a laugh. I said, there's 500 parking spaces on the whole site. I said, like, what are you doing? Like, come on, just you, you're putting things going through. So yeah, that was the biggest part. I've always been going forward. Um, and it's just general, like when you start taking staff on, like looking after, like, you're, yeah, it's it's hard. Yeah, I've been there, mate, it's hard. It's hard because... It's personalities. 
it's managing personalities and money and staff and just yeah. But having a, we we had a business coach coming because there were some things that there's some things I'm good at. I'm good at marketing. I'm good at selling. I'm good from there. There were some things I wasn't good at, so I, I just sort of thought, well, I'm not I'm not scared to ask for help. I asked for help on it, and this fella came in. He said, just take a full timer on, and I couldn't afford a full timer. I was like, I can't afford it. He said, no, but that full timer will help you build. I was like, okay, then fine, we'll take a full timer on. Did it, and the, I, I, the fellow I took on was brilliant. I don't know if you remember him actually, but he 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 was really good fun because it, it made me realise that. I can't sell this product just on my personality. It's got to be on someone else's as well because people were buying me for me, but people brought him for him and people were going to his classes over mine. And it was like, that made me realize, it was like, actually I've created this product. Obviously I say we've created this product, but it can't just be sold by us because not everyone likes me. Not everyone's going to like me. I've got to accept that, but people are going to like other people. So I had to then realize that I can't like all my staff I can't get on with all my stuff, but as long as they're doing their job, then I will get on with you and go from there. So there is that banter. Um, and I suppose dealing with them as well, because I'm very much, it's my way or the highway. It's like, I always joke that I think you're sort of mistaken it for a democracy when it's a dictatorship type thing. But I, I quickly learned that it's not like that. You've got to be a bit more open. So, but I had, I had my guys sit down and go, I really don't like working for you. I really don't like it. And it was like, it's really hard because it's difficult because Kate's this lovely person, but you're really tough and really strict. So I had to mellow because my old estate agency sort of trying to cut the person next year out type thing couldn't work in what I was doing. So that was a really hard way of doing because it's not me. It wasn't my personality at the time. I was very much, right, I'm going to have to rethink this. You know, there was times where I just thought I can't do it. And then I suppose the hardest one was probably COVID. Mm. That was hard. COVID, I, COVID for me, I, I, it sounds, this is going to sound really crazy, but I do sort of miss it because I loved some of the parts of it. I hated the biggest part of it was obviously not working. So when COVID hit, I, I learned quite a lot from two people I used to work for, a fellow called Paul Mason who used to work in London, and he taught me to look at, watch the markets and not necessarily bid in it he said but watch it because he said the way it used to work when the markets was up sales were sort of up and when the markets were down letting was up but when everything's down we're fucked and that was the way he sort of sold it to me at that early age so and there was another guy I used, I used to work for who taught me about branding and I always remember when COVID hit I just was like something's not right you can see everything was going a bit funny and everything was just I mean, it was one of the guys who works for me, our husband's in sort of a submariner, and he was. All, I always remember his son. He's like, when I went, like, and see, it was a cough, uh, it was a little cough in China, and it was, and that type of thing. But it was getting bigger and bigger. And my friend was in Italy at the time, and he was telling me all these horror stories. I'm being sent over to here, and I'm jumping from here and here and here, and I was like, this really don't sound right. And then, the day that Mr. Johnson said unessential things happened it was like someone just flicked an off switch we just stopped everything everyone we were just we had 900 cancellations in a day and it was like oh I couldn't even deal with the phone calls it was just going off the record and I was just like right we're going to shut we shut before the actual announcement for lockdown so it was like we need to make the right decision people are not going to come to us this is a bad market input choice and it's bad in the sense of thinking of safety because we couldn't get any sanitizer, we couldn't get anything, we would clean as much as we can. People coming to us worried for it. I mean, we don't just deal with ordinary people, we're dealing with vulnerable people as well. So they were doing it, and I was just like, we can't stay open, we need to shut. And So you shut before the shut, shut before. We were shut 10 days before the official one. See, I remember that. There was a weird time in the gym for us as well, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Because it was dead. We were wearing some PPE, we was cleaning, but again, it was like, we didn't really know what the, the right or the wrong thing thing to do, wasn't it? Mm. It was a really, really weird time, wasn't it? It was weird in a sense because inquiries just dropped off. People were just not coming in. We were trying to keep on top of it because there was like, there, there wasn't, it was unknown because there was cleanness. Oh no, don't do it this way. Don't do this. Where people, it was just unknown. And it was just, just like, we're not going to make any money. It was going to cost us more to stay open because we were just like, we need to stop. We need to just take this fact, this is coming, we're locked down. This is when China were majorly locked down and everything's going through. So we knew it was coming. It was not going to go to one place. It was going to Italy and it was coming to us. So it was, you was an idiot to say you weren't going to see it coming because you were. But I remember vividly, actually, we, we shut down. We, all the guys decided, right, we need to, 
we we need to go into a bit more banter we need a bit more fun so we were like filming loads of funny videos like just joking around we cleared the sites like basically mothballed the sites and um and then we just basically um it just started to look at everything and i remember sitting up going right where are we going to make this money because we ain't got any money coming in now we it was just as enrollment so i'd only just taken a little bit of money so i only had so much in the bank and i had vat coming out i had wages and everything else so i sat the first thing i did was find everyone i could cancel my stuff like bins everything else i'm not doing that um looked at what we could get through looked sat down with the vat phoned the vat man i'm "I'm not paying you i said and they were like you got a pass not paying you i said it's a choice between paying you or paying my staff i said my staff have got kids you've got enough in the coffers to do it no not doing it and then um i sat down with staff and it was a real tough day to sit there going look this is in the bank this is how long it will last if we pay you full rate this is what we need to get to in order to keep it going and we could last for seven months eight months nine months into this i said but after that it's gone if we don't open up in seven months time we're fucked we're gone no more and everyone's going in, everyone's going, right, I don't need to do this. I can take I can take a, a wage from it. And everyone was coming in. So we had this massive plan. This was before all of the furlough, everything. So we were just going through. I remember sitting up until like three, four o'clock in the morning, just balancing everything, going, right, you've got to go, you've got to go, you've got to go. So yeah, it was stressful. It was hard. It was really hard. And it got to the point where we were shut. It was getting to the point, the second, like we, we were months into it. And we were like, I remember... I think we were five minutes away from a phone call to go enough's enough because I remember being in my garden on the phone to my accountant going I can't do this anymore I just can't I can't take stress anymore because we were trying uh, on camera like to the customers to the kids we were putting a smile we were going through because we were doing lockdown classes at home we were trying to reinvent ourselves to do as much as we can to keep people interested we were doing online classes trying to do online badges doing everything we could to make any money but it weren't even enough to pay one member of staff's wages but it was something we were doing something as best we could and we were like we were paying money out of our own account like we were saving to do an extension at the time so we were just everything was going it was like I was losing more money than I was making and I just remember finding the account going enough enough we've got to look at end game now this is it I said we can't go any longer so we're, we're literally a couple of months away now we've got to go where, where do we go what can we sell because we weren't getting any help like one of one of our landlords did, did nothing. They were like, no, you, you, you rented it, you pay for it. Another one landlord thought, I can take, I can do it monthly if that'll help you. Yeah, no rent will help, but yeah, great. We can take from there. But one of them did nothing. In fact, put our rent up and it was like- <laughs> Put your rent up? Yeah, we had a lease arrangement and they put our rent up by 43% during that time. 43%? Yeah, but it was market rate. We had it below because yeah. we took our units low. So it was fine, okay, fine. But I sort of, my argument was that their argument was, well, we're in a pandemic as well. Mm. I mean, that's what they said to me we're in, we're in a pandemic as that's well. exactly like, what they said to me that's fine but you were bragging that you brought the place for 12 million cash like come on like it don't make sense here like you can't say one thing and not the other so it's it, I said that's fine but we're all in I said we may not be in the same boat but we're in the same storm I went mean, like you can at least do something even if it's the case of I'm not saying you're not going to get your rent defer it I said but just defer the rent. I said, right, let's just get through this bit. I said, and then we'll just bolt it on at the end and I'll just pay you monthly or whatever it's got to be. So I had to pay his rent and it was costing me personally two grand out of my own money every month. Like for the whole lockdowns, it was just coming out every time. So my extension was just gone. And I just said, I just can't do it anymore. Just, it was hard. I just, I, I remember, because it was like everything me and Kate had built over this period of time was just crumbled. It was gone. And we were like, we just opened a new site. It only been open a year. And we were like, so we, we were, at the time the businesses weren't potless but we were living not hand to mouth type of approach like we were building up reopening Plimpton and like and getting that going so I remember just saying and he just he was just saying to me just sit tight I know it's hard just sit tight just sit tight and I was like I can't sit tight any longer I can't put a brave face on any longer I've got to do it because it was just sleeping night. So I, was like, I can't have a sleep it's not I haven't slept for months I said like I just can't do it and then the announcement come for the lock, the restrictions and what we had to do and then we could open. And I remember being up for the restrictions and going through them with a fine tooth cone and go, all right, how can you make a how can you make an 18 month not social distance? It's impossible. Did and, you, sorry, to, uh, do you know with the um, the first lockdown when they did announce the furlough and the, uh, the, like, the business grants and bits and pieces like that, did that help? Yeah, massively. Do you know what I mean? Did, is that, the, is yeah, that really that. the reason that you stayed open? <laughs> yeah. Because I, mean, I, I know that's the reason fur, we stayed the fur, open. I mean, and well. do you know what? I mean, everyone, there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment that's slagging it off. 
ultimately, in our situation that we're doing at the moment, you're doing the best you can. Whether it's right or wrong, you're doing your best you can to survive. And I sort of believe what was happening at the time they were. The bounce back loans, everything else, yeah, were great. We took them. We never used them, but we took them. We just sit on them because, like, we... We just didn't know. We didn't know where to go. We didn't want to like invest in loads of money because we thought this could happen again in twelve months' time. I remember right? they done that like that that grant was about I can't remember ten grand if you're a certain size business that like, they give you just just for for being like having a retail unit. Yeah. So we got and then that, that yeah and then what happens is though is they don't stop your rent, <laughs> so they the council give you that ten grand, and then every month over that six seven they add it back with they add that back and more. And then you, I was just a bit like, oh God, like, so he's never any better off, was you? The really, problem, he was just he was taking was, it and then yeah, paying it back to him. Yeah. Instead of them the just problem was the, obviously one business had been going for a while and one business was brand new. So what, even though they're at the same numbers and making effectively similar money, one was seen to be the, high, the older business so it would get more money, but the other one wouldn't be. So you'd be, you were just trying to balance. So the money would come in and we'd have to, we would transfer into accounts and go, right, these, this is the money in the pot. We need to use it for both. So we're splitting it. So, and that's how we had to deal with it. Like everything went into it. And it, it, it was to the point where it was like, I just, it, you were juggling a lot of plates, uh, juggling, uh, spinning a lot of plates and just not very well. There were a lot of them falling off at points. And I just, the, our accountant used to, he was brilliant. And he just said to me, you just got to stick at it. He said, you had a profitable business. Like, you, you, this is not your fault. And after that conversation, I was on the phone to him. For, it must have been two hours. It got to him because he, I was on that phone call to get rid of the company. That was it. I couldn't do it anymore. I thought, you know what? I can't, I'd rather, I'm stressing. I'm, I was drinking too much. I was eating too much. I was just going mental because I was just in, I was stuck at home. I was, I was about watching. to say, yeah, just stuck in and yeah, I was worried about something. I was like worried. That. I just couldn't do anything. I couldn't, I, I had a, effectively not, a newborn baby. It was just hard work. And I just was, he was the one who said to me, you had a profitable business. He said, your, and this was the, the word he said to me, it to me, he said, your decision in your business has not ruined your business. He said, you, you have not made the bad decision that's closed your business down that's caused this to happen. This is a global thing. And when he said to me that, I was like, no, you're right, I haven't. He said, so sit it out. If it goes wrong at later, it goes wrong later. He said, but this is not you to go through. He, he, he sort of explained to me how it could go. He said, we could do this and we could do this. And I was like, okay, fine. So I sat it out and ducked down. And then the announcement came, we can open. It was brilliant. But then obviously the restrictions all come through. So we had to decipher those because... We, we we weren't part of a big national thing. We are a little independent club, so we're not part of a governing body. And the, But our instructors are all got part of it, so they are members of it and they have to train for it. But that governing body wouldn't give any information to any independent clubs. So we were like, I was arguing with them going, so you're a governing body and you're not supporting people in a pandemic. I said, I, said, I, don't, care. I don't want your paperwork and how to do it. All I want you to do is tell, show me how you trained me. How do I teach a handstand socially distanced from a child? Oh, we can't tell you that because you're not part of our group. So that was one thing I just went off a massive run with them with. And I was just like, right, okay. We sat down and go, let's look at this. Let's look at this. How can we make it fun? Um, we put it to the guys go right this is what we've got this is what we think this is what you're going to come back with and that's when it started to become enjoyable again and we really it turned for me i was just like i, I actually quite like this and we started to get understanding for it and i remember when the kids first come back it was just it was weird but i quite liked it the fact that the kids all the independent classes the parents had to leave because the kids for themselves they didn't feel like they were on show to the parents as much but even when the parents come back in it was trying to have fun and being bubbers but standing back and not being able to do stuff so we had we made these little dolls that um one of the sort of we they're they're not called a toy because you're not allowed to say it but we made these little sort of gymnast dolls that we've named different things to use to show the kids how to do stuff so we were like we'd manipulate them and go oh you do this and this and go so but it was just a way to think outside the box and that's ultimately where we came and we just it got to the point that we just got going again and I, I thought, right, we're getting back into this. And then the second lockdown hit. But I didn't find that one as hard because I thought it was a month. Let's rethink this now. And I, I just got, and we were away when we found out. And I was like, right, it's not often you get to sit back and look at your business and go, that works, that doesn't. So we used that second lockdown to really sit and look at the business and go, right, this is this, this doesn't work, this is rubbish, get rid of that, keep this going through. And that's, 
that's when everything turned for the better, I think. And that's when we started to look at COVID as a bit of a, it's not often, I was never going to get that time with my daughter as much as I hit, did, which was great. We're never going to get a time to sit because it's a hundred mile now. Like now it's back to normal. I barely have time to sit and talk, uh, to sit and talk to people and go through. And it, it was a nice to sit down and go, right, that's rubbish. Get rid of that. We don't need that. We don't need this anymore. We don't need this service anymore. We can bring that in house. Let's look at this. Right. How can we teach this differently? What equipment are we not using? Get rid of that. And it was just a really nice reset. And I still, that's why I, it's like a, a running joke. It's like, I do miss COVID for that because it was a, re, a way to reinvent yourself and do things differently. Like there's some stuff that we still do today that were part of the restrictions purely simply because we like them and actually it worked really well and so there was loads of positives out of it there was tons of stuff we did um and then obviously the third lockdown hit but again that one and that's when we started getting COVID because I never that was the January one wasn't it January to March I think it was March April that but that one that one didn't feel as bad I don't know why it didn't feel as bad I think because we were so conditioned to it and it sounded really funny. It was just normalised. And at that one, I was just like, right, we aren't going to go to it like we did before with the live classes. We're not going to do it. We're just going to film the classes. And we, like, when we first started filming, it was really hard because we didn't have a budget. We're going through, so we were filming on our cameras. We, lucky enough, one of my fellas was, um, he did a direct and they did a directed degree so he was he could make the film. So he'd be doing that at home, like, voluntarily doing it. And it was just... It was a bit, I always describe it as like wartime type thing with my guys. And they were like, they really come together. Um, and it's been really difficult coming forward because the ones that survived with COVID are really close. Like they're more like brother and sister type thing. And I think it sometimes knows that when new people come in, it's like they, because they weren't part of the COVID lot, they don't have that same understanding like that we all do, that we can, we, we call each other names. I mean, we, we do treat each other like blood relatives sometimes. And it's like, it's really strange because like some people go, I can't believe you say that to that person. Like, I, I really thought, I really thought you didn't like him. Like, but you generally quite like him and stuff. And it's just, yeah, it's just one of those things. That, but I think like anyone in leisure, it was hard. Mm. It was really hard. Yeah. I mean, you guys work in leisure. It was, it was difficult. I mean, from my perspective, from a kid's one, just, it was hard because you had to, manage adults but then you had to try and keep children socially distant yeah it sounds yeah i don't, I don't think there was a right way and and the government kind of proved that by changing the goalposts continually throughout as they were getting more information in there yeah. and, and the bit and that, and do you know the bit that annoyed me out of everything that the government done was the fact that they were aiming and suing they were like if the guidelines were broken it was the business's fault mm -hmm. so if if for some for some for some people some people used to come in, I remember shouting at them, going, just get apart. I said, like, listen, I don't care what you do. You can talk to each other. But if you want to talk to each other next to each other, just go outside. I don't want you in here. Just go. And it was just, it was hard work because ultimately, if anyone got fined, it was the businesses. So that if someone... That, it was they, huge fines as well, wasn't it? I Especially it if you like, like... 10 grand. 10, 15 grand. Yeah, yeah something it, like that. Yeah. It was just like... I didn't feel like that was very fair. Like the business has been hit enough. Yes, we had the help. And granted, we took the help as much as we can. But it was just difficult to say that the business, it's a business fault for some idiot that didn't, couldn't read the rules or didn't believe in the rules. So I, I always remember, though, my, uh, my favourite thing out of all of it was my granny fight that I had at one of my sites where basic yeah. my granny fight, there, was two, there were two grannies that come in and... One, one full punch up, or it was close. It was close. <laughs> I'm not going to say because I can't because they'll they'll know. But it, it was uh, they came. One came in with a mask down here, and one came through, and they were just shouting at each other. It got to the point where they were shouting at each other with their mask down, and someone had gone up to them going, "Listen, you need to take your handbags outside because this is going. You're scaring the children going through." And it was all because of wearing a mask, right? And it was just I was just like, I was, but at the time with the mask. I was obviously the person I was with was being really serious, but I'm laughing because I'm thinking this is great. I can laugh behind this. <laughs> yeah. Same laughing. But, yeah, so yeah. No, oh, the peaky nose used to drive me mad in the gym, mate. The what? The peaky nose. Oh god. Like you said yeah. people. There's, there was a couple of repeat offenders in the gym that would always just wear it like a, a weird yeah. beard, just with their nose stuck. Yeah, out. nose so stuck out, or like 
not put it on quick enough or yeah. put a visor on and lift the visor up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Wear so a visor like a peak. Like, this. <laughs> <laughs> like, his, like his fucking baseball gown. Yeah. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Like shit like that. The freakiest ones was when the people used to come in with the little plastic strings so you could see their lips. Mm. That used to freak me out. I've never seen that, I don't think. Oh, yeah, just, like the see-through ones. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. Ones. Yeah. They were just really freaky. They were a lot. We didn't use them because we had our own little branded ones because again, I was just like... I'm going to use this as a marketing perspective. So I literally just, I made masks that had um, our logo with little COVID, um, basically viruses around it. So I thought, well, we've got to have fun with it. I mean, my view was, this is really scary for the children. This, this, is, this is going to affect them. Like, this is, this is like a once in a lifetime thing. Like, no, like, obviously not in our lifetime again, and probably not in our kids' lifetime again. But like, it's, it's never going to happen, but it's, it's going to affect them. We need to make fun of this. It's scary enough that they've got to come in and go for it. I mean, we've got children coming that are deaf and I'm like, how am I going to teach you if you lip read? And I'm like, so I, I had to then go right. So I had to make sure that I was two meters apart to take my mask down to talk to, talk to them and then put it back on and then carry on class. It was just like, but you had to, but then at that point, it's like, okay, I've got to sanitize my hands, take my mask off, put my mask back on, sanitize my hands and then go. So that's, that was the process and it was always that process of going forward. It was such a difficult time. It, like, just for, like I said in ledger, it was mm. it was so hard to keep to the keep to the rules and still do your job. Does that make yeah. sense? Especially when people are paying you. I was a PT at the time, and you know teaching someone to deadlift from this sort of distance. Mm. You know if they had incorrect form, yeah, it, it was so hard because then you'd be like, Wait, you got you got to sort your back out, and then they're like, well, how? And I'm like, well, this, yeah. <laughs> but I can't well, align their back for them. Yeah. Or like yeah, even even these like spotting, you spotting, just can't do it. Well, we you? couldn't spot, could we? No. We couldn't spot, so no. we couldn't go heavy. And then we we can spot, so we were like, right, we're gonna we're gonna try and see how we can do it. So we had to again we cut woggles in half strap them together so we could hold the kids for a distance that we we're allowed to be because we could be on certain children it was like if you actually read the rules you you didn't babies there was no social distance rule so only under a certain age i think it was it must have been two two or three you could actually go near them and pick them up as long as you had permission and stuff so that was easy but the older ones you couldn't do it so we were trying to new, learn different ways to teach forward roles so we would make up loads of stuff like maybe doing a bit of a woggle holding around some net like so we're distancing or going through or being being at a point that we would literally mask up completely that we'd be doubling up on everything to actually go near them and but it was it was just basically it was your understanding of it and it, it was nice because a lot of other companies were asking us how did you do that what did you understand that from and it was just it was silly little things like making because everyone had to be sat like the parents that were there like for our three-year-olds had to stay so keeping them socially distant apart or i didn't want to just have marks on the floor with feet and saying like stay two meters apart but so i made it a road so we made it a one-way system we actually drew like with permanent tape an actual street inside because one of my sites is a street within a, a, a like a street within a building so it's a massive warehouse but you walk into it it's like walking into a street and so it's like got shops it's got a little underground station like a really dodgy building shop it's got a little toy like it looks genuinely like that but so we made the the whole thing like road with chevron so we stay on the chevron so rather than making it because it was people were scared people were scared and people didn't want to do stuff they wanted they knew their kids had to do something but people were scared to do activities and even those that come back i mean we we had to start again i mean we when we went into covid we were just shy of a thing i'm gonna say about 800 at a time it was like just because we just opened plimpton it wasn't very long so we went from there to 300 so we had to go through and then we slowly built it back over the course of the time people were slowly trickling back in f fairly quickly to, like to the point and then obviously there was nothing else to do but people were generally scared like how can i do this i don't know what to do and it, it was like you say a hard thing and the the hard thing was when you got the parents who were really upset because they they didn't know how to handle the situation they couldn't they were upset for being next to someone and they were well, that was it some people took it so so extreme and then some people didn't give a fuck mm. so that was the issue you had with everything even at the gym or wherever we were I, I remember being at a line at a Tesco's once and I was behind a, an old lady with a, I had my mask on and you remember that everyone used to skew to go to do their shopping so I was in that and I was probably this far away from her and she turned away and she just went could you move away please <laughs> I was like I, I can't really go anywhere I'm nowhere near you she's like I can't get ill it's like, I, I, I don't know what to say to you, really. Like, so, can't okay. really go any further back. So, <laughs> you know I, I mean? so, but yeah, like that, it was a strange, strange time. And I have to say from a, from a children perspective, it, it was really weird. Cause like, 
I know it sounds funny. I changed my mindset of, do you know what? I'm going to worry about what we do and the kids because it is going to affect them and it is going through. Because I could see, obviously, at the time I had, oh, it was like nine and like my my youngest was 18 months so at the time. She, she, I no, I think she was, yeah, she was 10 months when we went into COVID and then she was like from there. So she celebrated her first birthday in lockdown, so effectively. And um, it, she, it, it was really weird because my son is the most placid individual ever and even it made me takes after his mum then I take it Pardon? takes after his mum then yeah the, <laughs> the door is not she takes after me <laughs> she's yeah she's nuts um, and basically she he went back to school like he, obviously I didn't really want I was, I'm very much like you can't play games until you're the right age so he all of his friends are playing Fortnite but I'm like you're not 12 mate you can't do it but I was I sort of got to the point where it's the only way he's actually going to have social contact. Yeah, I was like, oh, my boy. So, and I was like, I've got to let you have it. But then he was like, he doing it. He did really well, actually. It was quite nice to see him enjoy it because I was thinking, oh, actually, I've got, I've got a playmate now type of thing. But he had a fight with his friend online and he was going back to school and the fight went into school. Now, this is a kid who, this was when he was younger, they were saying he's got problems he needs to see someone type of thing he's got anxiety problems he's like really nervous type of thing so he's gone into school and smacked his friend because this fight just boiled over but because he's not been in that situation he's been stuck at home for so long he's seeing obviously me and his and my best mate mucking around and joking around like things like as you do and he just thought that was normal and he's just going front i can't what do you do so it was literally i didn't know what to do it was in my face i just wanted to whack him one and that was it but and my youngest I mean, she she just loved it because she got on with it. But she sort of, when she went back, she was really nervous of other kids. And she's sort of now just feral, but yeah, she's just, yeah, she's uh, she she's very much like me and gets herself in situations like me as well. Yeah, no doubt. Nobody, not all of the situations, eh? Yeah, I mean, she uh, the, the one, she punched a monkey. <laughs> what, an actual monkey? Yep. Or a, okay. She, punched, she, we went to, I, Listen, he, he, I, what he didn't tell you I'm like go for it I get this too. so we went to Gibraltar went for a day trip we were told from this tour don't have an ice cream up on the rock he said just wait to get on the bottom because there's loads of monkeys up there they're going to take it and she, she the, the little girl she is she's this tiny little redhead and she's just she's adamant I'm on that I want it now I'm like okay you can't have it no I'm going to have it so I was like, okay, just, she's tired. She had a little bit of problems because she'd been ill. Like we'd been, we would have been to the hospital with her because she, her tonsillitis had popped and God knows her tonsils had popped. And anyway, so we're up top, I had this ice cream and I said to her, stay in there. We'd just come out of St. Michael's Cave. This monkey had come in, beelined her, grabbed her ice cream. Any normal child would give up an ice cream. She punched it in the face. <laughs> <laughs> she punched it in the face. And do you know the look of someone of, you hit me? You hit me. And this monkey was like this. And it was like this going for a second while she's slapping it, going through, end up losing it. Again, like normal children would walk away. She's chasing it. And we're having to chase her because she wants this ice cream back. <laughs> and I'm like, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Why would you do that? And yeah. So yeah, she's, like you say, she's very much like me. She mm. has been there. Now, I want to I get into like, I guess, the sort of nuts and bolts of the business in regard to what it is you that you do. Um, and I guess that's that's quite a funny kind of segue in actually because working with kids, you must see some funny shit all the time. So so just real quick because you've you've kind of touched on it a few points. So obviously gymnastics school for kids, uh, you've touched on various ages. So what's the youngest? So the youngest we teach is four months. Um, it's um, all of the stuff. So all of our ages are broken down. So we've got four to eighteen months, um, and at that age, you you sort of basically introducing core fundamental movement so it's about um building up timey time building up core strength so you start um even those would still do forward rolls and backward rolls um and then you, you sort of try to i say i'm gonna say brainwashing because it's the best way to describe it you, you sort of start the movements that you want to carry on into later life so for argument's sake if you're doing a forward roll you're saying tuck your head or head under if you keep saying that they'll eventually go down and but we do like a handstand which we call a donkey kick so we do the sound of a donkey going, ee -oh, ee -oh. so but the reason we do that is because so for the child or the basic to know not to tuck their head so they use sounds more to learn and that's a way we try to do things um and then we sort of 
basically what we do from four months uh, in any weeks every week is set up like a themed week if we for example doing forward rolls with the four month old we're doing somersaults with our tw- like 11 to 12 year old like 6 to 12 year old so and they're all broken down so we have uh, 4 to 18 months 18 months to 2 and a half years 2 and a half to 3 and a half at three and a half, they basically go in independently and then it gets broken down into different squads. So we have um, a three and a half to four group, bronze, silver, gold. And the way to look at it, and I don't like using it in this way because I think it's sort of very mainstream type thing, but it's the only way to describe it. Bronze is very much beginner intermediate. And so silver and gold is intermediate advanced. So that's where they start to learn hard skill and know what they're doing. So that's from that age upwards then to, to 12, yeah? So 12 years old. I mean, we've got, I've got 13, 14 year olds that just, won't leave they're big (laughs) but they just enjoy it they don't want to go and that's the ethos so like so like my son if he's 11 yeah could he come along now and just start because his agility is terrible and he's good at football but it i think it was sticking with the lad yesterday said in the car to him he said jack your skill is so good he said but if he was more agile like me he said you'd probably be the, the, the best player in the team and then when he got home last night he was like, Dad, do you think I'm, I need to sort that out? I was like, yeah. I was like, you're not the quickest. Well, he's not the... I think his problem is he's not very nimble. He's a bit like me. He's, he's like a fucking shed. So he just runs in a straight line and his agility is not great. Mm-hmm. So was, when you've been talking about this, I mean, in my head, I've been thinking, ah, oh, could See, actually help him. Yeah, I mean, yes. you know, Because they use... I'm using gymnastics. Gymnastics is based for a lot of sport. So you can go any... Any sport, you can probably go back to gymnastics purely for the fact of the stretching, agility, moving around, the, the type of movements you do. Um, but with an 11 year old coming in, we've got people that come in that literally come from different sports that go that have been recommended to go, go and practice your skills, go and practice your Because even like cartwheels, for example, you need to obviously be quick, you need to have the upper body strength, but you need to have that agility to get your legs out nice and wide. Yeah, you can't balance. do anything. So that's that sort of thing. But you, you would break it down. So I've got. I can't go into massive detail individuals, or yeah, of course, but yeah. there's been children that have come in that literally are like boards like this that you're trying to you go through, and it is just practice and go through. And the way, because ultimately, our basis when we did this was recreation gymnastics is not that it's not a thing; it's not a thing that a lot of a lot of clubs do to make money. Their money is made by competitions, so that was our mindset: is that recreation gets put aside. And ultimately, and I don't mean this derogatory, the the fat kids in the world, because I was a fat kid, I was a big lad, and um, they get left behind and I just wanted them to enjoy it in that way. I wanted them to come and go, I can do that and I will do that type of thing. So we just break it down. So if we can't, like we try and practice our basic shapes, we go through the skills. And because we make it fun in the sense that, for argument's sake, we'll do... um, we we'll do like a themed week and we'll do it even for the older ones. They, they go, for, oh, well, that's just a bit babyish. All right, well, then make up a story then well, and just go through. And we start to do different skills or, you're, right, you're leading the class this week. You, you do it for me. So it's just a way to do it. But ultimately, if someone's really good at something, so for for example, like your son, your son, he's agility side of thing, we would then focus on, one, is stretching, two, obviously jumping, because it's amazing how many children can't jump. It's like, it's really difficult. They skip. If you actually watch, like, and they jump, and actually their feet as well. Like sometimes you see a lot of children with feet goes out, which sometimes can mean to be certain problems. They might have sort of be tight in their joints, they might tighten their uh, tighten their like, tendons, type of thing. So there's lots of things that people don't necessarily see because you just see children every day. Like they see their own kids every day. Um, so we can just sort of base our classes around that. And we, I've got scenarios where children come in that have got are so tight that we spend a lot of time that we base it on right try and touch your toes like let's go into sort of forward rolls and for example keep going from there practicing our front supports practicing that core strength and just build it up and build it up and like balancing on the beam you'll be surprised how many people that can't balance on a ball that's 10 centimeters wide because it's up high because it creates an optical illusion so you think you're higher than you are but it's just that moment of I can't do this I just can't do it so it's just getting that movement but having that flexibility to even swing your leg around in front of each other can sometimes it's just if your body tightens your muscles are already tight are tightened even more you can't move around so that type of thing is brilliant a lot of the times as well most like you're like you're saying you son they probably like doing somersaults so then we'll go right what's the skill you want to learn and then we break down the skill from that. We break down, bring it back and go, right, let's get you to do the basics. What can you do? Well, you're going over like a ball, right? Let's do some tight balls. Let's do some rock and rolls. And we've been doing that quite a lot this week, actually, lots of different jumps. And 
really focusing on that. And actually, just that straight jumps, pointing on their toes, the amount of kids that are now touching their toes this week because they're stretching themselves out without realising they're stretching. And that's the big thing. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Cause I, I guess I've seen the other side of it because I've brought my son in yeah. pretty much from four months. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've, I, I've not really thought about, I guess, that other challenge where you get an older kid come in who's, who's stiff as a board. But I know for my lad, bringing him so young, it's his confidence physically. He's like gone through the roof as a result of doing some of the work with you guys. We, we do a lot. I mean, uh, bear in mind, we've seen, yes, we go through it. I mean, we've seen a lot of children over the course of time. And it's, there's certain ones that have started really young. And you, you can tell the ones that have started young to ones that have not. And because they just get it, they just understand. And you can see, like, we're seeing it quite a lot now. Those that really put the work in over, sort of from four months old that are now starting to go off. I've just been accepted to this squad. Or I'm just going to go into football. I'm going to go into diving. Um, I, I know because my friends and stuff well, there's two of them different ages but I, I'll use them as a good example I firmly believe their youngest is probably at a similar level not because of what he does for us because he's been away from us for a long time but he started at such a young age he was probably one of our youngest ones because he was our guinea pig one because we were like you're indispensable we'll use you type of thing because you've got another son <laughs> and we're joking around, like, joking, around, joking around like that but it was we just used to use it but you can see the two like differences and I noticed the difference between my two because my son started, we only started this, he was sort of 18 months too, whereas my youngest started from a couple of days old. So she was the first, she was my guinea pig to see what's the differences between her and the older one. And there is massively because her understanding of it, her her development of her brain, she seems to be quite ahead of her time. Like my her dexterity skills, that's the biggest thing, her dexterity skills moving around. So she can actually start to sort of do things, very fine movements that I know my son couldn't do, probably because we just didn't have that remit to do it with him because not that we didn't know what we were doing with it, but we were setting up a business. We were trying to go through, but he just didn't do that at that age. He didn't necessarily do it. But the nice, the biggest thing about, you think you find is children at the moment is a lot of them are fixated on um, technology. They're fixated on, they don't do very much. They don't do this and that, they just see the top of their head. So, it's getting them to understand that it's not going through, that they don't have to be a TikTok video. They can actually have fun. Yeah, it's um, so important for kids, I think, isn't it? As you say, they're getting more and more just inactive now. But yeah, I think I think with my kids, like just, like you say, the ability to jump, it's really noticeable we can jump, but also just his, his climbing ability, his confidence. The other day we took him to soft play. It was, um, I think, at Hensley. Yeah. I and mean, he was in the soft play and there was this thing he was trying to climb. I think I showed you the video, I'll show you yeah. afterwards. And it was like just a hole, basically. He was trying to get up, but it was up to about here on him. So he couldn't quite get, get enough head. to get up and he was kind of stuck. And I was trying to coach him through it. And in the end, what he managed to do is he grabbed his, he lifted his leg up, grabbed his foot stuck his foot up there and used that as like a lever to, <laughs> to, to get him up. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. But... I took him somewhere else and I put him on this big log to, to have a little look around and to get him down I was like oh, he's you know he's up pretty much my head height and he's like I was like come on just jump down and he's like alright yeah. and just yeah. the bravery to do that sort of stuff is, is really cool it's just he used to do hand balance as well didn't he yeah yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, did I ever show you the video where I was holding him on one hand yeah yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. I'm known for balancing babies on my hand it's it was uh it's something when Kate was, Kate had, Kate's the science behind all of it. So I'd go from there. So she was had all the books out and she had a book and I just had this page and I just saw this, this fellow, I can't remember where he was from, but he was holding a baby and they did other things with it, which I thought, well, that's not a better thing, but that is quite a cool thing to do. So I thought, I'm having a go, I'm having a bit of that. And we, <laughs> we were, because it was when she was like studying to get all this set up. And the, the theory behind it is that Obviously, if you're tricking, the brain tells you what to do to your, your muscles to go out, but you're tricking the baby to stand at a very early age. So you're doing the same movement without the brain doing the movement. That's the one thing I did learn that day. Uh, don't go from that. But so I was like, right, I'm going to do this. So I do it. Anyone that comes in, it's great fun to try and just trick this baby and they stand up and see the parents like, <gasps> <laughs> drop it like that and just go balance it. And I know with my youngest, he used to freak out lifeguards because he used to go swimming and he used to literally lift her out of the water because she'd like bob around the like, straight up and I'd be looking away. I know when she's going to come down, but she's like out the water. Drop, you, have you dropped any yet? No. No, that's good. <laughs> no, because uh, do you know what? You just sort of know, like when they're, when they're about to come down, they sort of give you a little twitch mm. to know oh, enough right, enough. Okay, so yeah. you know they're going to come down. So I haven't there. I did drop my son. But that was if that's how I learned not to drop them because it was like that twitch was the giveaway. Yeah. But it was I've not dropped anyone else. But no, it's it's just one of those things, and it is such a important thing. And 
it's something I teach the babies a lot that I you got to stand. Mm -hmm. And it is really funny that those kids that have done it and really parents that really practice it at home, they've all walked really early, uh, really, really early. Like my daughter walked at 10 months. I've got, and it, it, they're starting early and early because I think they just got that muscle power to know to get up and stand and move around. So it is a good, it's a, it's it's cool, a cool thing to do. It's, it's, a, it's a really cool party. Yeah, it's cool, isn't yeah, it? yeah. We did it, I did it quite a lot. It's just, just sort of balancing around. Well, I got the, I didn't have a photo and the only photo I've got, and it just shows what a bad person I am, <laughs> a bad parent I am. I, um, the only photo I have at the time was Betsy when she was six months old we were in Turkey and I was at a phone party. So she's basically at a phone party at six months old doing it on, stood on my hand and just doing a hand balance. So I felt like that photo. <laughs> yeah. so, and, I'm like, and I had, I was like, oh, I don't have a photo of her. And I just got back and I was like, please don't judge me as a parent, but this is what we're trying to do. Like, cause I didn't have the picture I normally had and just showed them this photo. And I'm like, you're so, you shouldn't be a dad. Like, <laughs> it's, it's literally one of the coolest baby pictures I've ever yeah, seen. Is it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. I think I might start it. It's just literally, just, she's just stood. But it's like, the, you know, in the moment of going, like, partying, she was just like going, I'm, that's it. I'm here. I'm like loving it. Yeah, it's, it's she's just, it was just one of the things. But the nice, when you, the nice thing about it, seeing with that type of thing, like for you, for guys, it's like, it, it just shows that, the belief that we had to go through it. This is what we can do. And it isn't just about, ultimately, yeah, we're doing it for business to go through, but we are doing it because we enjoy it. I, I love my job. And it, it's nice to see that development of children. And I know that some parents that go through that, it, particularly after COVID, it's been quite hard for some kids for just socially, but it's just that development of starting at early age and just the pushing, like just go through it, just, Trust me, it'll work. I know it sounds funny. You may not be getting it now, but you're starting a basis and it'll go like that. It'll just click. And once it clicks, but like, oh, I don't know what I was worried about. And it just goes in. And it's like, I remember when he first went on his own, because I think I took his first class when he went on his own. And it was just really funny to see him come in. And it was just that moment. He didn't, it's like, bye, off he went. He was just going through. But that type of film, when you see someone come from an early age and develop, go through, you sort of become like their pseudo uncles and aunts because it's just the way it is. But the um, guy that touched on the subject from corpus kids, there is a flip side to it as well because the kids that come in that can do everything that don't want to do competitions and that's where they're sort of pigeonholed into doing that type of thing all the time because they're really good. We have quite a lot of those coming in that are able to do stuff, but they go to places that, oh, you'd be good for this, you'd be good for this, but they don't want to. They just want to learn cool stuff and they just want to go from there. But they become a little bit like they just have fun with it and they become really social. So there is, there is a flip side to the ones that can't do it to the ones that can do it as well. Mm. What's the future plans for the business then, mate? You mentioned that there was the ball bubbers. Is that what you called it? Ball bubbers. Yeah. We've got, um, so we've got Plymouth City Patriots, a basketball club. We joint venture with them and we have uh, a ball bubbers that we're trying to launch to go forward. It's been going, it was a, a slow builder to start with, but we're now at the point where we are going to start to roll it out and try and make it more classes within Plymouth. And that's effectively what we do, but with different, I'm going to say with balls because it's going to sound funny, uh, go through it, but with balls. So it's all different ball sports. If you, if anything you can do with it, we can just make it fun. So, and it's starting to get into a groove of things now. It's like, like effectively like we were at the beginning when we set up the gym, it just takes some time to get your ideas to work and some stuff doesn't, some stuff does. So that's the plan to get that going forward. Um, I'm hoping to get some new sites open. I've got the feel at the moment to try and open two new sites to expand the gym. Um, and just keep, pushing really i mean we we came out of covid from wanting to shut it down because it was all going to part to coming out going it's all or nothing now we just need to push it i mean i just i feel that it's the right time now to do it compared to where it was so i'd like to try and get southwest tapped up and then just see from there um and maybe just look at potentially franchising and go mm -hmm. from that so, yeah, maybe franchise it yeah. there's a lot of paperwork in franchising oh, it's a nightmare isn't it? <laughs> i don't do you know what? That's probably the, the thing that sh that I'm I'm having to learn. I'm trying to. I don't quite understand how it all works. Like licensing is an easier option to try and go through. You don't have the paperwork to go for, to into it, but it's a lot to trust other people. I think, like I said earlier, I always try. I always say it's a sort of dictatorship, not a democracy type thing. But when you go to that franchise route, you you become a democracy because you don't. Yes, you want it run that way, but it, you're only as good as the person that buys the franchise, and that's that's the bit that puts me off and as much as yes it would be quick at making money going forward there's just a lot more that we aren't we aren't physically set up for it because like you say we still 
we, I, I wouldn't say that we're a, a, a small business. We're not. We're probably a medium-sized business, but we run it a little bit like a small business. So I'm still trying to get that to catch up. I've never got that balance, um, which I'm slowly getting there now by just getting the infrastructure in place going forward. But yeah, that's my plan is to try and get a bit more going. Yeah. Franchising is a way, yeah. but... You'd need a mm-hmm. curriculum or something like that, wouldn't you? So they would just be just the same... Through, like what they do with um, CrossFit gyms. Mm. A lot of franchised CrossFit gyms have the same workout throughout each gym mm. but that that's what, what we do so both our sites are run simultaneously so yeah. you literally we could you could look at them watching the screens and they'll be doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time oh, yeah. at exactly the same point like they are run that way but our guys are trained like that and the, it is a good way of working because it means that if you've got someone that's got to go and cover they could just go in and do it and they we've set them up to be exactly the same as such so there's nothing different you go walk out of one you go and see the other the building looks different but it's nice that you can do the same thing as well but it, the difficulty with that is when when you go further along that you can't see them all the time and you can't do it, that's where things start to become a little bit more, I'm going to say clicky and politically, it, it become politics, start to get involved, it becomes really difficult because you've got, oh, well, that's not, that's not doing it and that's what it is. And it, it, that's the bit I don't, I like where we're at at the moment. It's not like that. And I know Kate was working for another franchise company that was, there was no input and that's the bit that I never want to happen. I want, I'd like to be able to these, these, because what works here isn't going to work in London. So the way we run it down in Plymouth isn't going to work in London because they're different clientele. It's a different way of doing anything that you have to ask permission to pick up a kid there. Like that type of thing. It's a different life right in that way. So I want, I would like to be able to do it that they can run it in a different way, but still do it in the bubbers way type thing. But it's, it's finding that balance to do it. And it's a very difficult thing to try and get someone to believe in your product to do it because it is a very unique thing to do. It is because it's not, when I tell a lot of people I teach gymnastics to kids, it's like, you really? Like, it's that type of thing. But it's, it's just, you've got to be that type of person. It's a bit like, I couldn't do your, your guy's job. I just, it would annoy me because I know what, well, you used to train me. I know what I was like to be, to have someone train I was a nightmare because I'd never used to do it. I used, used to phone me, why have you done this? Why have you done that? I'm like, oh, I just, sorry, I just fancied it. Like, but the problem is that it's hard. It is hard to try and do a thing. But could you guys do what I do? I don't know. It's just a difficult thing. But no, I can't, I couldn't I, I, Genuinely, I couldn't work with kids every day. Hmm. I couldn't. I, do you know what? I always joke, I have a kid every day and a teenager by the end of it. It's always, <laughs> it's like every day. But it's it, it does help you it just um i have to say i do go home and be very quiet which is unlike me i do i have to just to sit in i just sit and play computer games and just not do anything geek out yeah. mate that's perfect um cool. we'll pop your details in our description so if you want to check you out um it's definitely should um but yeah thanks for coming on mate it's been a fun thanks, chat mate. Appreciate Cheers, buddy. thank See you, you mate. cool